Alright, let's get started while they're walking. So, our last week of the day is going to be Emma Kavielta. It's going to tell us about sigma functions on curves with non symmetric sigma. Hi, thank you very much. This is for us. Thanks for the opportunity. Now, uh-huh. even the breadth of this, of, of this um, workshop, I thought I would talk a little bit about some things that you can do with combinatorics and um, put together applications to solving um, explicitly partial differential equations and uh, um, and uh, also some connections with um, rings of commutative rings of differential operators, which uh, um, still hold many mysteries. So let's see. My first um, job will be to talk about um, relation between um, integrable system and differential algebra, which was started in, in the 19... Oh, no. Okay, so we need to recompile this thing. Someone has to help me. This is the uncompiled file. I'm so sorry. There's supposed to be a picture here where it says postcard. We do these things. Somehow, it, it was compiling, but it didn't um, do it. Okay, second try. Okay. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's a soliton. This, they made a postcard uh, for Math Awareness Week in 1992. Um, so this quarterback de Vries equation, right, um, um, this controversial issue, uh, of whether solitons exist, solitary waves, in the 19th century uh, was uh, solved by, um, by someone uh, following an actual wave in, um, in, in Scotland. And um, in any event, this is the equation. So why should this have anything to do with algebraic geometry? And the nice thing is that uh, because it's a wave, uh, then if you are an applied mathematician, you immediately try special solutions in which the the function u, the shape, depends on x and t in a way that's uh, linear, x plus the velocity c times t. And um, if you do that, you get an ODE, which is the equation for the Weierstrass P function. Okay. And, um, and so you get elliptic solutions. Okay. So now let's see what happens. Um, now we switch to differential algebra. Okay. And uh, we're going to see the elliptic curve come up in a different way. So if you look at all... Um, 
ordinary differential operators in one variable, okay, preferably for me with formal coefficients, formal power series in X. Okay? Uh, and you, you look at a, a commutative subring. Okay? They are very interesting. And take one which is maximal commutative. Well, it's, it is, turns out to be the centralizer of just one element. And the reason is that in this context, um, it's my fault. I, I, I was too cold. Oh, you're turning it off. You're turning it off. You're trying to turn it off. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. Hmm? It, it doesn't look like it turns off. That's what I thought. I did write to the facility about the cold in here, so hopefully they can get it to turn off. But not right now, sorry. I'm so cold, you hate me. So, um, if you have one fixed one operator and you take two operators A and B that commute with it, then they must commute with each other. Something very nice that doesn't happen with matrices, that doesn't happen in several variables, but it happens in uh, in, in one variable. And, 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 and this is um, what makes a centralizer a, a, an extension, a transcendental extension of degree one of the field of coefficients. And so it's a curve. It's an algebraic curve. It's just one variable. Okay. Now, the, the rank is an interesting, very interesting invariant, which um, if you have the, the rank of any set is the greatest common divisor of the orders. And in a, in a, in a ring, in a commutative ring, uh, it's the greatest common divisor of all the uh, differential operators in the ring. So if you have a rank one uh, ring, it's like a line bundle over the curve, over the spectral curve, because they have a common eigenfunction, a common eigenspace of dimension one. If the rank is two, then it's a vector bundle of rank two. So over each point of, of the spectral curve, you have a two-dimensional vector space. But the, the rank won't come in very much in my, in my talk. In the early 20th century, Burchell and Chondi um, classified all centralizers of rank one. They are affine rings of their common spectrum. And uh, the X variable is a flow on the Jacobian. Now, the idea how they show that, it's so simple and so beautiful. So they introduce the transference. So let's say that they have two generators, which is basically the only case, the case that they studied. And um, so then you look at the common eigenspace uh, for two eigenvalues, lambda and mu. And lambda and mu, you can view it as a point in, on the curve, on a, on, a, on a plane curve, x and y, the, the, the variables. And then, then um, you have the um, eigenbundle. You have a common eigenfunction, which depends on this point P, which I should have said is, 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 has coordinates lambda and mu. The point P is lambda mu. And, um, and you look at a common eigenfunction, which is a function of x, and then you construct this um, other operator C. Now, for uh, simplicity in the theory, the, the derivative d, d by dx is indicated with a partial. I'll explain why in a moment. And, um, but that's d by dx. And then so d by dx minus psi prime over psi is a right divisor of all the operators in the ring because psi is a common eigenfunction. You can do Euclidean division 
and then conjugate the ring um, with C inverse on the right because everything is divisible by C and C on the left and you get an isomorphic ring of differential operators which is the same curve because it's isomorphic and the only thing that changes is the line bundle and what you've done is to the original line bundle that corresponds to L and D you added the point P so uh, you know the line bundle is from N, uh, G points just let's say genus G P1 plus PG then you add plus uh, lambda mu and um, and you up to linear equivalence, that's a different divisor. So you're moving on the Jacobian of the curve. And, um, okay, but this is just the X-flow. Um, oh, um, so this operation, um, in, in the case that the spectral curve is, was singular, you take away the singularity. But if not, it's an isomorphic curve, and you move linearly on the Jacobian. And uh, iterating the transference gives you the whole Jacobian, because the Jacobian is, you know, you, if you add G points uh, where G is the genus, you get everywhere on the Jacobian. Okay. Now, um, why did this thing become fashionable again at the end of the, well, no, in the 1970s? Uh, but from the 1970s to the end of, of the 20th century, in uh, the Birchall and Chondi theory, beginning 19th, uh, 20th century, was kind of forgotten. But then um, the um, um, it's in the ne next transparency. So please allow me to 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 go through this now. So uh, in the 70s for reasons which you see in the next transparency, um, Krichever revisited this theory and uh, he produced with the inverse spectral construction, uh, given any curve, produces this commutative algebra of differential operators which has that spectral curve and um, gave the coefficients explicitly in terms of the theta functions on the Jacobian and so um, uh, no, it's here now. It's it, it's here, not in the next transparencies. So this was important because um, the uh, actually the applied mathematicians realized the existence of the spectral curve just by modeling solutions of the Korteweg de Vries equations and other equations, uh, many other soliton equations. Um, so then Peter Lax came along and um, realized that the Korteweg de Vries equation, which I showed at the beginning, is um, equivalent to the commutativity of two operators in X and T. And, um, and that the time deformation was an isospectral deformation. So what you can actually do is you can see the other deformations, the time deformation, on the Jacobian of the curve. And the, um, the, the, the completely integrable system, which has this integral, integ integral manifold, the Jacobian of the curve, uh, can be... Um, uh, made in, it can be put in correspondence to the formations of these com commutative algebras of ODOs. And then the resulting PDEs are the soliton equations. Okay. So, um, what um, I'd like to talk about now is the differential algebra aspect. So, the interesting thing is that um, The orders of the operators in the algebra, I already mentioned them when I mentioned the rank, correspond to the Weierstrass semigroup of the spectral curve. 
And this can be seen because of hmm. let me see if I have my example in the next page. Yeah. Let's take a look at the uh, elliptic curve in uh, this um, context. Okay. So I want to commuting operators are here are called Would a you like a Oops. Yeah, sure. I did something wrong. Oh. I just did something wrong. I, I I thought I would click next. I'm sorry. Is it better? Yeah, it'll amplify your voice. I thought I had one already. Like this? Like this? Like this? Yeah, just like that. And then you move that a little bit towards your mouth. I never use this. There you go. Try saying something. Is it working? I think now it's working. I don't think the, the previous one was working at all. Thank you so much. It's easier now. <laughs> Excellent. So I, I was on the example. So my two commuting operators here are called A and B. And see the, or, the order in uh, D by X is 2 and 3. And that's exactly the... That's exactly the order of, of pole of these two functions viewed on the elliptic curve. So please look at the equation of the elliptic curve. Mu squared is equal to 4 lambda cubed minus g2 lambda minus g3, written in virus transform, where the g2 and g3 are the invariants. The, the two operators L and B satisfy this equation. So B squared, the operator B, is equal to 4L cubed minus G2L minus G3. And that's the reason why the order of the operators correspond to the Weierster semigroup, to the non gaps. 2 is the order of pole of the elliptic function, the Weierster p function. And 3 is the order of pole of P prime, the derivative of the Weierstrass P function. So, so this is the link. Okay. Now, how do you go to curves of higher genus? This will just remember the Korteweg de Vries equation in, in the, in the, in the case of uh, you know, the simplest soliton, one soliton. But to go to n solitons, you need higher genus curves. So we need a generalization of the Weierster sigma function. Uh, sigma in genus 1 is such that the second derivative of sigma, second logarithmic derivative of sigma, is, is the Weierster p function. So we go back, we integrate twice, and then climb. Uh, came up with the uh, generalization for hyperelliptic curves and uh, one other type of curve, non hyperelliptic, but only genus 3. So after the uh, PD uh, boom in the 1970s, uh, people started revisiting these um, special functions in order to find really usable solutions to the PDEs, you know, if you really want to do something with them. And, um, and so uh, particularly this uh, uh, fantastic uh, uh, generalization created by Bush, Schaber, and Olkin, Leikin in the uh, 1980s, and, um, and then Ayano later um, uh, for telescopic curves. These curves are still very special. So I didn't write the equations down because they are very technical, but the NS curves, uh, I'm going to go back to the elliptic case, if I can. Okay. 
the NS curves are curves with just a, a mu to the n and a lambda to the n. So they are still affine curves in the plane. The telescopic curves are curves in space, but still they have a one uh, fixed point, and then you look at the Weierstrass semigroup at that point. So the um, the poles of all algebraic functions at that point, and they are still very special. That's why they are called telescopic. And uh, the reason for these restrictions is that in order to construct this sigma function, you need a basis of differentials of the second kind, and then uh, uh, you can write your um, and then you can write your. Um, power series expansions like you do uh, in uh, for the Weierstrass p function or the sigma um, uh, or, or, or the Weierstrass sigma function in genus 1 and so it's it's a little bit technical um, but it's it's complex analysis uh, and you you have to have all these functions in order to construct them um, in all of these the ns curves and the telescopic, you know, for some reason, they have a, a symmetric Weierstrass semigroup. So this point at infinity has the important property that 2g minus 2 is a canonical divisor. And uh, equivalently, the last Weierstrass gap is 2g minus 1. And uh, and in this case, it's easy to see that the Riemann constant is a half period on the Jacobian. That's a little technical, but very standard stuff. So, the, uh, you know, there are two problems. One is more classical, determining which s s numerical semigroups are actually appearing as Weierstrass semigroups, sorry about the typo, of a curve at a fixed point. And uh, this is an open problem. The second problem is once you have this Weierstrass semigroup, suppose it's non-symmetric, can you still write a sigma function? So I've done a little bit of work on both of them. I was uh, fortunate enough to um, join forces with uh, Komeda, who is an expert on um, the first problem, and uh, Shigeki Matsutani, who is an expert on, on the second problem. And so um, for problem one, for example, another typo, um, we showed that this semigroup is Weierstrass for the first time. Now you may not find it exciting, but it's related to modular functions. So it's, it's, uh, we were asked the question and, and we were able to answer that. And we did that by constructing a curve which was covering a cover of two curves. Um, and one of the two curves that it covers has non-symmetric semigroup. And so we worked really hard and we found an explicit sigma function for that symmetry. Can I ask a question? What's the yes, genus please. in this? What is the genus? The genus in these, for these curves. Yes. So for the big one, it's seven. And then uh, this one other that I wrote down, three, seven, eight, it's three. And you know what? That's why I brought one page from my paper. I, I, I think it's five. I think the other one is five. Because you have a configuration of three curves, and that's how we constructed the sigma function. So the three and the five, we were able to construct. And then we put them together, and we did the seven, genus seven. Um, the x curve cannot be planar. And to construct sigma, we produce its affine ring by combining the affine ring of two planar curves. Okay. So, thanks for asking. <laughs> okay. So, I don't know why I don't have the tight section, title section here, but I am switching gears. 
So um, just to, um, to summarize what I wanted to, to do here, um, now we were told to keep it, um, you know, accessible. So I didn't put technical formulas on, on here, um, but I'm trying to summarize the first part because I'm going to go into a second part. The relationship between algebraic geometry uh, or uh, spectral curves and uh, two things, the um, uh, commutative subalgebras of differential operators and uh, on the other hand, you can take the formations of these in several variables, and so PDEs. And I talked very little about those, but uh, yeah. uh, that's one of the things that you, you typically want to do and want to do concretely as, um, with as much information as possible. So the two challenges that I wanted to uh, mention, because they are computationally and um, combinatorially exciting. Uh, one is the virus to semigroups, and so um, with, some, uh, with some hard work we were able to produce these. And, um, and the other one is the sigma function, um, which, is, um, uh, which is more, um, more important for solving the actual um, integrable systems and integrable differential equations. Switching gears, and I don't have a title, but maybe there is a maybe there is a typo in my table of contents. You can tell us the title. Yes, you I, can I, tell I, us the title. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's um, it's um, differential resultants. Differential results. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, Suppose you have this commutative algebra. Suppose someone gifts you these two commuting differential operators. Or suppose you write two differential operators as in the example here, where you write an A and a B with arbitrary coefficients, U, A, and um, lowercase a and lowercase b uh, functions, functions of x, and you impose the commutativity condition, okay, which is an ODE, and you solve it. How do you find the equation of the spectral curve? How do you find the polynomial that they, well, the equation of their spectral curve, the equation of which uh, they are identical solutions in X. Because if you plug the operators instead of mu and lambda, it, it holds identically in X. That's the miracle. So um, you find it by a, a, a generalization of the resultant or elimination theory in, um, uh, for algebraic equations, so in algebraic geometry. And you just generalize the elimination theory. You write a Sylvester matrix for the two operators. You take derivatives of the coefficients. You take the determinant of that matrix. If they commute, it's independent of x. And it's the equation of the curve. OK. But what do you do when you have more than two operators, OK? So by Euclidean division in uh, this ring, where k is a differential field, and I denote, again, d by dx by the partial symbol del, that's done in the theory because there are other variables like t, uh, like time. So usually you, you denote the by dx by a, a, a partial. We can find the greatest common divisor of two operators, and then um, when they have uh, when the uh, commutative ring has rank r, the greatest common divisor has order r, and then you write the r plus first subresultant of the Sylvester matrix and the resultant 
is the equation of the spectral curve. Now, if you have a general curve, and this is a, a, a work in progress with um, two co-authors co again, um, Sonia Rueda and uh, um, Maria Hangeles Zurro, and um, with them we decided to look at the spec at the, at the Klein curve. So, in um, the Klein curve cannot be written as a as a as a as a, as a, a In the case of the, so what's what's the best way of saying it? So the, the Klein curve is not hyperlift. It's it's planar, but but it's a quartic. It's a quartic yeah, planar curve quartic. with with lots of automorphisms. So we just uh, decided to look at the Klein curve, genus three. Um, I want to relate to. I want to relate to this point at infinity at which I'm looking at the Weierstrass gaps. Okay. Because if I have this point at infinity, then my um, commutative algebra of um, differential operators uh, is a, a scalar algebra of differential operators. But what if I have more than one point at infinity? So how do I explain this? I am... Okay, it depends where you start. Yeah? Uh, so if you start with this commutative algebra of ordinary differential operators, they have a common eigenfunction and they, um, and they have a spectral curve. The point is that that spectral curve in a natural way has just one point at infinity because the common eigenfunction is has an essential singularity at infinity at one point. I think you, you need to write the equations to see that. Okay. So if you start instead with the Klein curve you can't do that, and um, you have to have several points at infinity. And Kirchhoff extended this inverse spectral construction with a curve with more than one point at infinity. And what we're trying to do is to make it explicit for the Klein curve. And um, we showed that two points at infinity suffice, and so we're going to um, construct a ring of matrix differential operators in one variable, two by two matrices, they act on vector functions, and uh, it's not the same thing as going from a, an order n differential equation to a, an order n linear system, it's, it's different. It's different. So we have these several points at infinity. We have these algebraic functions with those two essential singularities. Uh, sorry, with those two singularities. They will be essential singularities of the common eigenfunction. And um, what we don't have is the resultant. We don't have the, the Sylvester resultant in that case. How do we write the equation of the curve? Okay. So we propose a resultant matrix. This is the work in progress. We were able to make it work and check that uh, it is a, a, a bona fide resultant, that the sub-resultants give you the line bundle. Uh, we were able to check it in the hyperelliptic case, not yet for the Klein curve. So uh, we're excited because this, this is going to be also a kind of combinatorial um, construction. Burchell and Chondi, when they wrote their um, uh, theory, they were able to construct a much more efficient version than the Sylvester matrix. 
they were focusing on just two generators for the um, for the for the ring uh, of affine functions, and uh, in that case, if the two generators of the commutative ring has orders m and n, the Sylvester matrix of which you have to compute the determinant would have size m plus n times m plus n. They were able to make it size m, just one differential operators. Um, I was able to take that apart when I was writing my thesis, and um, I divided the Sylvester, Sylvester matrix into four blocks, and um, and then I, I took the uh, conjugates of these four blocks and then added them together, and and, and I got the Bertrand and Song matrix. And the the um, the thing is we are doing now is we are doing it for the case of of matrix differential operators. We also were able to construct in the hyperliquid case for now a more efficient um, resultant that you can compute in much less time because it's a smaller matrix. You have to compute the determinant. So I'm afraid this is going to be a short talk. No, thank you very, very much.